Well, that certainly could have gone a lot easier. Welcome to the middle of nowhere. It's a great time to build a PC, what with prices coming down for not just GPUs, but just about every component out there. The PC you see right here cost me just under $2,240 before taxes, and luckily I had zero shipping costs. If after watching this video, of course, you were to put together this PC or something very similar, you'd pay just under $1,950, again before taxes and any shipping. Which says a lot about how much NVIDIA 3000 series GPU and AMD 5000 series CPU prices have come down. As with most of my builds, I purchased the parts as they became available or were on sale. And because I bought most of the components during the GPU apocalypse, I did pay above MSRP on the GPU through EVGA store. However, I was able to save quite a bit of money on other components by being an astute shopper, such as with the ASRock motherboard, which I bought new for $90 under MSRP. While AMD just released its new Zen 4 CPUs and Nvidia's 4000 series GPUs are nearing launch, I'd argue it's still a great time to build a PC as Ryzen 5000 series CPUs are heavily discounted at the moment. RAM and storage is fairly priced once again, and the supply chain woes of the last two years seems to have been largely alleviated. If you have an older PC, you can't go wrong with a Ryzen 5000 or Alder, Intel Alder Lake system. You'll still get great performance for gaming, streaming, and creative work. Plus, sticking with the current generation as opposed to shelling out for the newest and greatest means you'll have tech that's mature, stable, and most importantly, discounted. Now enough jibber jabber, let's go over the parts for this PC build, and as always, I put links to the items I discuss in the description below. Starting with the CPU, I went with the Ryzen 9 5900X. It's probably the most well-rounded of the current AMD Zen 3 CPUs. It's 12 cores and 24 threads, has a base clock of 3.7 GHz and a max boost of 4.8. I purchased the CPU for its original MSRP of $549.99, but you can currently buy it for anywhere between $350 to $380. That's an amazing savings on a great CPU. The 5900X will be able to take on anything I throw at it. Compiling code, rendering 3D models or animation, photo and video editing, and of course, playing AAA games. The 5900X does not come with a CPU cooler, so I had to pick one up to cool this amazing CPU. And I went with an air cooler over an AIO liquid cooler or a custom water loop to both save money and prevent any additional points of failure. As the focus of this build is to be for content creators, I didn't want to add a part that could potentially fail resulting in downtime. There's no chance of liquid getting all over components and should a fan fail, it'll be easier to replace than an entire AIO. For my cooler, I chose the Scythe Fuma 2. This is a well-reviewed CPU cooler and competes nicely with top-tier CPU coolers from the likes of Noctua and Be Quiet. Add to the fact that it was on sale when I purchased it and it was a no-brainer for me to get. It has six heat pipes and comes with two fans to help dissipate all that heat the CPU will produce. It's also built to allow for tall ramp kits, comes with a free screwdriver, and looks pretty spiffy if I do say so myself. For the motherboard, I went with the ASRock B550 PG Velocita. While I would have loved to have opted for an X570 board, I was trying to keep the PC to a sub $2,500 budget, which is pretty easy now, but not so much when I was buying the parts. As such, I opted to go with the B550 board so I could have at least one PCIe 4.0 NVMe slot for fast storage, as well as a PCIe 4.0 slot for the GPU. The PG Velocita originally sold for $220, but I bought mine on sale for $132. The near $90 savings was too good to pass up, and I do believe I'm starting to get good at finding deals. Other selling points for the PG Velocita besides that hella good deal are the 2.5 gigabit per second Ethernet port, two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports on the rear, one a Type-C port, and the USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C front panel connector, although my case won't be able to make use of this. Ultimately, the PG Velocita was a good bang for the buck purchase, and I already updated the BIOS so it can handle the 5900X. Currently, you can buy it for around $150, and for more information on this motherboard, check out my video on it. Now, all of what I just said is true about the ASRock board, but unfortunately, since Murphy's Law kicked in with this PC build, I ultimately did not use the PG Velocita as I could not get any picture from it. After doing some troubleshooting, I decided to swap boards for the Gigabyte B550 Aorus Pro AC. It has loads of rear USB ports, including two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, one Type-C, and I've used it before with my 5950X, so I didn't have to update the BIOS to get the 5900X to work. I do have an idea as to the root of the cause of the issue, and I'll talk about that more later. Because having a good amount of system memory is important for creative work, I knew I wanted more than 16GB of RAM. DaVinci Resolve loves RAM by the way, so do keep that in mind if you're entertaining video editing. 
Because 64 gigabytes at the time of purchase was way too expensive, I settled on a 32 gigabyte kit of PNY's Accelerate Epic X RGB RAM. It's DDR4 3200CL16. While a 3600 speed kit would have been more optimal, RAM was not cheap at the time of purchase, and I paid only $90 for this PNY kit. As of today though, you can buy a DDR4 3600CL18 RAM kit for the same price and minus the RGB lighting. Want a faster latency RAM and or lights? Be prepared to pay at least 50 bucks or more. Bottom line, I think this build will be okay with the 3200 speed kit. As the focus of this PC build is for content creation, I knew I'd need plenty of storage, so I opted for three drives. Two fast NVMe M.2 drives, a PCI 3.0 drive for the OS, key programs, and even some games, and a PCIe 4.0 drive that will make use of the PCIe 4.0 slot. This drive could be used as a fast scratch or cache disk for creative work. Finally, the third drive is a SATA platter drive and will be used for mass storage, i.e. music files, images, documents, etc. My choices are the Western Digital SN750 500GB PCIe 3.0 NVMe drive. I've been using WD NVMe drives since they first released. They come super close to the performance of what Samsung offers with their Pro NVMe SSDs while being much cheaper. I highly recommend using Western Digital drives. This drive will go into the bottom M.2 slot on the PG Velocita and be the aforementioned OS drive. The second storage device is the Sabrent Rocket 4.0. It's a 1TB PCIe 4.0 NVMe M.2 drive. My main reason for buying the Sabrent drive was to simply try it out. I've never used a Sabrent product before and it was affordable at the time of purchase, even beating out the comparable WD offering. Finally, for mass storage, I went with my tried and true choice of the Seagate Barracuda 2TB hard drive. At 2TB, the available space could get used up rather quickly, but it's a start, and for the creative professional, once that begins to fill up, it would be wise to get a NAS or some other kind of mass storage anyway. Cooling all of the components of this PC are 5 RGB fans by up here. I decided to go with this 5 pack of fans because they are affordable, well reviewed, and they're an inexpensive way to add some pizzazz to the build. Unfortunately, there are some downsides to these fans as well. You can only control the RGB and that's done via a remote which can be lost. They all have proprietary plugs that go into a SATA control box. There is no way to control the speeds, so they operate at 1200 RPMs all the time, and they have a 23.9 decibel rating, which really isn't a negative, it's just another fact. Luckily, all five fans together aren't terribly too loud. The fans are bright and the colors vibrant. They are ARGB as well, as there are some preset lighting modes that show that off. But I won't be doing any well choreographed lighting with the RAM and GPU like I could with the Corsair IQ setup. Ultimately, these are budget fans, but if you want ARGB, consider saving up a bit more for more control. If you want to use your motherboard manufacturer software, go with some Fantex ARGB fans. They're pretty affordable, 4-pin PWM, and you can daisy chain them to reduce cable clutter up front. If you want to use third-party software that will definitely be more refined with loads of lighting options, but also have more control boxes in the back, I suggest Corsair, Lianli, or NZXT. Keep in mind you'll also be paying more for those. Powering this computer is the EVGA Supernova G6 1000W 80 plus gold fully modular power supply. I know a 750 to 850 watt PSU is recommended to power the GPU CPU combo for this build, but I didn't want to press my luck and I wanted to maintain that 80% efficiency under load, so I opted for 1000 watts. The Supernova was also fairly affordable at the time I purchased it, and it can be bought for even less now. I've used EVGA power supplies for several PC builds now and have not had a single problem. They seem to be pretty reliable, are well constructed, and are based on a Seasonic design, a very reputable PSU maker. The Supernova also has all the cables I'll need to power this PC and any peripherals I install as well. In addition to the RGB fans, I decided to add a tad more flair to the build in the form of cable extensions. These affordable cables are by Asia Horse, another brand that has garnered a positive reputation for their extensions as being affordable, of good quality, and nice to look at as well. These are black and gray, and the covering is a nylon braid design. They are pretty flexible and not too stiff, and it's not too difficult to add the combs to the cables either. Adding cable extensions to a PC build is definitely one way to improve the looks of your PC without emptying your wallet. Just be aware they can cause additional clutter in the case when it comes to cable management. Housing all the components is the Fantex P400A. It's a mid-tower case, has a glass side panel, and has plenty of room for all the components, as well as good airflow. While it doesn't have a front USB Type-C port, the P400A offers plenty of storage and fan options, and is big enough to handle all the parts I've chosen. If you'd like to find out more about this case, check out my video on it. Finally, the GPU. For this build, I'll be using an EVGA RTX 3070 Ti for the Win 3 Ultra. 
This is the highest end 3070 Ti EVGA offers. It has 6144 CUDA cores, 8GB of GDDR6X memory, a boost clock speed of 1816 MHz, and an effective memory speed of 19000 MHz. While a 3080 or 3080 Ti may have been a better option for a creative machine due to the increased amount of VRAM, and while they are much more affordable now, at the time I purchased the 3070 Ti, those two cards were going for well over $1000. This 3070 Ti cost me around $820, but you can now buy it regularly for around $680. How times have changed. Even with less VRAM compared to the higher end GPUs, the 3070 Ti will still serve any creative type well and should perform bang on in gaming. This is definitely a chonky GPU taking up 2.75 PCI slots, but realistically it'll take up 3. There is a diffused lighting across the side for that sweet RGB goodness, but you can also set it to a solid color should you choose. Overall, I've heard good things about this GPU from EVGA and I'm excited to use it in this build. That's all the components for this PC build. Again, I was targeting a build that's geared towards someone who's going to do creative work in addition to or in lieu of gaming. What do you think? What parts would you change and why? Let me know in the comments below. Now let's move on to the build process for this PC. It was not without its hiccups. Because the ASRock PG Velocitas BIOS was version 1.10 and 5000 series CPUs weren't compatible until 1.20, I had to update the BIOS so the 5900X would work with the PG Velocita. Unfortunately, there's no BIOS flash button on this motherboard, which meant I had to install a 3000 series CPU, a CPU cooler, RAM, and a GPU to update the BIOS for the 5900X. This lack of a flash button is the main gripe I had in my review video for this motherboard. I do have a 3300X on hand, so I was able to update the BIOS no problem, as well as pretty much confirm all the parts worked, including the motherboard. While time consuming to set up, updating the BIOS went smoothly and quickly. So why swap motherboards then? When the build was complete and I turned it on, there was no picture, and the PG Velocita had a postcode of 98, which after doing some research has to do with PCIe devices. Well, I have four installed. Two NVMe drives, a GPU, and an M.2 Wi-Fi card, which I think uses PCI Lane, so I'll count it as one. After doing basic troubleshooting of taking out and reinstalling RAM, using a different GPU, removing the NVMe drives, and even reinstalling the 3300X, I still couldn't get an image. I finally swapped the motherboard out and got a similar error, albeit with Gigabyte's debug LED, staying lit on the VGA light. Because I knew all the PC hardware worked, my next step was to swap out monitors, but I still had the issue. Because the second monitor also had an HDMI connection, whereas the first only had a single display port, I decided to see if the HDMI signal would work. Lo and behold, I got an image. Then on a Lark, I tested a different display port cable, this time one with a lock mechanism, and that too worked. I then swapped out the monitor for the original using that second display port cable, and voila, instant image. Bottom line, when you troubleshoot your computer, it might not be any of your expensive bits that are broken, but rather it might just be a $10 cable that died or possibly isn't fully plugged in, which has also happened to me. That monumental issue aside, what was it like building the PC in this P400A? Let me just say, building and routing cables in this case was easy until it wasn't. The main pain points came with routing cables through the top and bottom holes. There's just not enough space for cables or your fingers. I also couldn't route the GPU extension cables through the holes just below the motherboard. Speaking of, if your motherboard's USB 3.2 Gen 1 port is on the bottom like this Gigabyte motherboard here, expect the case cable to stick out quite a bit. Luckily, I had a low profile adapter handy which I used to keep things tidy. I've used these adapters in several builds now and I love them. I put a link to it in the description below. As for the top, there just was not enough room to route the CPU power cables through the case hole. I had even pre-connected the CPU power cables to the motherboard before installing it, but it wasn't enough preparation. Thankfully, you can remove the P400A's top, but you do have to take out nine screws, which is a bit of a hassle. When building in this case, I definitely recommend removing the top to save time, to save yourself some pain, and possibly to keep you from getting cut. I also recommend pre-routing as many cables as possible. As for the CPU cooler, the Scythe Fuma 2 has just enough clearance to get the glass panel on. One good thing about the case is it has plenty of room to install even longer GPUs than the massive EVGA 3070 Ti. As you saw during the build, I had to flip my hard drive upside down because EVGA's power supply cables are also upside down. This is a bit annoying. I'm sure I could maybe twist the cable to get it to match up with the hard drive when it's installed right side up, and I may yet still do this. I did some research and there's no issues with mounting a hard drive sideways or upside down, which is good. 
Finally, figuring out the cable management at the back was a little tricky, not because of tight spaces, but because there is a lack of cable tie down points beyond the three Velcro straps, which just aren't enough. And don't expect the Velcro to be strong enough either to hold bulky cabling. While there are a few metal loops, they are placed near the Velcro straps rather than in strategic locations. I really would have liked to have seen the 2.5 inch SSD sleds moved over, maybe a centimeter or so, and some loops put along the side of the case to better tuck away the CPU power and any other cables coming down that way. While I wasn't able to do the cleanest of jobs with the cable management, it's less of a mess than what I started with. Ultimately, I had very little trouble getting the rear panel on and there's no bulge from cables pushing out, so well done there. When it came to software, installing Windows and drivers was simple. The drive I wanted to install the OS on was recognized immediately and I didn't have to initialize or format it. I did have to initialize and format the two other storage drives, which is to be expected, so that they could be recognized, but this wasn't a problem. With regards to installing and updating everything, I had zero issues updating the BIOS for the Gigabyte board, chipset drivers, or setting up XMP for the RAM, enabling Precision Boost Overdrive, and turning on Resizable Bar. It was all a piece of cake. After installing everything, I updated Windows and then it was off to the races to playtest some games. While there are a total of 10 fans in this system, which is a lot, I don't feel the PC is terribly too loud. There are 5 case fans, 2 fans for the CPU cooler, and 3 for the GPU. The 5 case fans do run at a constant speed of 1200 RPMs, and as stated earlier, when going over the parts, they cannot be adjusted, which is a shame. I did however set up a curve for the CPU cooler fans so that they can get uh, pretty quiet if the temps are low enough. And while gaming, I never even noticed the CPU or GPU fans revving up. If the GPU fans do ever get too loud, I could always set up a refined curve with an MSI Afterburner or EVGA's Precision X1 GPU software. In a room with an ambient temperature of 23.8 Celsius or 75 Fahrenheit, the system stayed nice and cool at idle. The CPU averaged 37 degrees C and the GPU 29.8. I'll speak about temps while gaming in a bit, but first let me talk about the RGB lighting for a moment. And before I do that, you can hear the case fans. I mean, there's five of them and they're at a constant speed, but it's not too bad. The motherboard has a small light strip on the rear IO, which you can barely see. The RAM lights up as do the GPU and fans. The motherboard and RAM can be controlled by Gigabyte's very lackluster RGB Fusion 2.0 software. It's overly simple, has a limited number of presets, and you can adjust speed and brightness as well as pick from a myriad of solid colors. The GPU RGB can be changed through EVGA's Precision X1 software, and finally, the case fans can only be controlled via a remote. There are several modes you can cycle through until you can find the one you want, or you can choose a solid color. All these methods of controlling the lighting makes for a mess in my opinion, it's just too much. I definitely look into either non-RGB fans or RGB fans with a more robust software. As for the RAM and motherboard, there's little I can do but explore some third-party open-source software that's floating around. I've yet to play with EVGA software, so I cannot really speak to how easy to use it is or how many features it has or doesn't have. When it comes to gaming, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this PC will without a doubt easily handle any game at 1080p resolution on high settings. Because I wanted to push the system, I decided to make use of my old Acer 1440p monitor and only test games at that higher resolution, so you won't see any 1080p benchmarks, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. First up is Fortnite, and I played with two settings, Epic and High with Epic View Distance. I found that even with the beefiness of the system, Epic settings led to a bit of a choppy experience. But this could also have been down to the Wi-Fi connection maybe. I'm not really sure. Regardless, I barely could tell the difference visually between Epic and High, but the FPS difference was fairly dramatic. As far as temps went, the CPU and GPU only got into the 60s during my two rounds. Oh, and I found out if you suck at this game, like me, you don't need to have good aim, just get in a vehicle and run people over. How's that for an advertisement for Hopping Shotgun Simulator? I mean Fortnite. Next is GTA 5, which is always a fun game to tinker with, as even 9 years since its release, it still looks great and can make certain systems fly or fall. I only did one benchmark run because that one run did so well. Everything was on very high and sliders all maxed. I normally struggle to get the 1% and 0.1% lows to be decent, but in this single run, I felt they were very good. The benchmark didn't stutter at all where it normally has on other builds I've done. Overall, I was very happy with the results, and CPU and GPU temperatures were also fantastic. Elden Ring is gorgeous and deserves to be played on settings where you can appreciate the eye candy. Because it has a 60 FPS cap, that was my goal. While my average FPS on maximum settings was basically 60, my 0.1% lows again were so dismal the jerkiness present in Fortnite was here as well. 
I switched things up to high and the game ran infinitely smoother with the average 1% lows and 0.1% lows almost all matching. I still suck at this game by the way, but my son loves it, so I'll keep testing it in various PC builds and maybe one day I'll actually play it through. As with GTA 5, the temps while playing Elden Ring were very tame as well, which surprised me to be honest. This next game might be considered a guilty pleasure, but it's one I'll fully claim. WWE 2K22, like Elden Ring, is a console port and it also doesn't require anything more than 60 FPS as well. The textures are great and some wrestlers look more like the real thing than others, but overall it's a super fun game with a thriving community. I've got over 230 hours played in it as I climbed the My Faction ladder and I haven't even touched the creator features. Or My Rise, which is the story mode for the game where you create a wrestler and bring them up from training to the top. With everything set to max, the play experience was flawless and I had the lowest temperatures out of all the games tested. Going away from less demanding games to possibly one of the most demanding games out there is Cyberpunk 2077. I played on two settings here, Ray Trace Ultra and Ultra without ray tracing. Both settings use DLSS set to auto as well. I honestly couldn't really tell the difference between the settings visually, so your RTX on or off mileage may vary. And it may very well be, I just haven't played the game enough to notice all the eye candy with ray tracing. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on ray tracing as a whole. Turning off ray tracing definitely helped the FPS overall, but not as dramatically as I might have thought. I bet if I had set it to high preset, then I'd have easily broken 100 average FPS. Temperature wise, playing this game saw my CPU temps at its highest of all the tests, while the next game seemed to have taxed the GPU the most. Next is the first of two MMOs I played. New World is nearing its first anniversary and I've been playing it more and more on my own PC. I figured why not see how well this new build handles it. I played on two settings, very high on everything and then high with very high textures and terrain. The first setting seemed fine at first, but then I started encountering some severe hitching that was very noticeable during gameplay. When I switched it up to high with very high textures and terrain, I had much smoother playing experience. Because cities tend to be more crowded with other players than out in the wild, I also wanted to try and get two different experiences at this more playable setting. There was definitely a dip in frames while in the city, but honestly with all the buildings, NPCs, and people it makes sense. While full of rocks, trees, and other gatherable things as well as wild animals, the undead and passing players, the wild still wasn't as taxing as being in a city, and the FPS showed it. Although in the wild my 0.1% lows were horrible compared to in the city, and I'm not sure why. Temperature wise, the CPU and GPU were about on par with Cyberpunk. The last game I played is another MMORPG, Elder Scrolls Online. This is a game I've been playing since open beta, and I had a request to test it in future PC builds, so here it is. Because it is an older title, and although there have been some graphical improvements over the years, I felt no need to restrain myself and put the settings at ultra for pretty much everything except for reflections, which I set to high. I also did two tests, a mixture of PvE, roaming around Mornhold and Deshaun, a dark elf city, and also fighting some monsters and goons just outside it. The second scenario was in PvP, which is the most likely place to see some frame drops, and performance hits due to all the people spamming abilities, especially if you find yourself near a ball group, which I did. Amazingly, the game did not really suffer. My 0.1% lows were less in PvP, but the average frames and 1% lows were nearly the same as in PvE. I did notice that for some reason my FPS never went above 100, so I wonder if there's a cap that I need to remove. Temperatures were really good as well, with the CPU maxing out at 62 degrees and the GPU at 53. For my final test, I did a multi-core and single-core test in Cinebench R23. This is a 10 minute test, and as you can see, the system scored fairly well. However, my main concern was with the CPU temperatures during the multi-core test, and I'm happy to report that the CPU never reached above 81 degrees. This just shows how well the Scythe Puma 2 can cool the beastly 5900X. And that's it for this PC build. Based on all the game testing I did, I think it performed excellently. I also think if you do more settings tweaking than what I did, you could get even better gaming results. When it comes to pricing this build out, as I said at the beginning of this video, you can buy all the parts for a little under $2,000, which is a dang good deal, especially considering the performance you'd be getting. To put it in perspective, when I bought all the parts in 2021, I paid roughly $300 more than its current cost. Because GPU prices have fallen and because the 5900X's price is severely cut right now, you can definitely save a lot of money. You can also get a faster RAM kit with the same capacity for as much or less than what I paid for mine. Even with the next generation of CPUs and GPUs upon us, this is still a great PC. It performs well, stays cool while in use, doesn't get too loud, and even has some flair to it in the form of cable extensions and RGB. It's a system that can handle just about anything thrown at it, and it definitely makes for a great gaming and content creation PC, be it video editing, photo manipulation, streaming, 3D modeling, programming, or all of the above. 
Thanks for watching everybody. Hit that like button if you liked the video or at least found it helpful. Feel free to share any questions or comments you have down below. Show your support for the channel by clicking subscribe and don't forget to click that notification icon so you don't miss out on any future content. And hey, while you're here, why not stick around a while and watch some of the other videos I've made. I'm Seth and I'll see you next time in the middle of nowhere.